Pastor Mark. Good morning, Crossroads. It is always, always, always a blessing to come here. Um, I am. We are so thankful for the faithfulness of you as a body um, walking with us for this incredible roller coaster journey that, that God is leading us on. And I, I'm laughing at that stream because that's probably moved more than many of the strings you have back there. Hasn't it? It's just, just everywhere we've gone, everything we've done. Um, and man, it's been an adventure. It's been incredible. Um, it's incredible what happens when you truly pick up that cross and follow Christ. And where he leaves with that. We, we uh, gave up a long time ago planning our future, planning our steps, because often God is showing just one or two steps down the road and, and takes it nowhere near what we were thinking about, nowhere near what we were planning on. And it's incredible looking back. We have a, a, a plaque up on our wall that says simply, God is in the details. And when we look back in our lives and see how God was working and arranging things, preparing us for those next steps, in fact, an example of that, um, it, it's crazy, it's been so long, COVID really messed up our, our home ministry assignment schedule for being able to come and update churches very well, and so it's been quite a few years since we've been here, so I don't think we've actually shared with you even about what our ministry was in Europe and in Germany. Um, last time we were, here, we were here, I believe we shared about how we were serving in regional leadership in West Africa. Um, working with national leaders, working with our missionary staff, equipping and empowering them, and seeing incredible things happen, having a blast doing that, and really seeing national leadership step up and, and, and do wonderful, amazing things. And it came to the point where World Partners approached us and said, hey, Jeremy and Mindy, what's going on in West Africa is incredible, um, great things happening. What you're doing there in West Africa, would you be willing to do that in Europe? And we looked at him and said, you guys are crazy. No, we, we know Africa, we don't know Europe. This is, that's a whole different field, a whole different programming of the mind. And, and how is that even possible? Um, but we said, okay, we'll, we'll pray about it. And of course, when you take that step of prayer, often that's the, what opens up your heart for God to be able to work in it. And we ended up in Europe, France for a year and a half, and then Germany after that. It was really interesting, though, as we were there, um, I was doing full-time regional leadership for World Partners, working with our, our missionary staff there, working with, with our, our national leaders there. I had spent multiple years previous to that um, learning language. Um, we, well, way back when, when we were raising support to go to Venezuela, we were learning Spanish and then ended up that we were going to go to Guinea, so had to go and, and, and do intensive French language study for a year. Ended up in Guinea, where we then learned the Yolunko language, and that became our ministry language, our ministry focus, um, to be able to minister well in, in heart language um, among the Yolunko people group. And then when we moved to Senegal, French kind of became our ministry language, where we were getting really proficient in that language as we went all throughout West Africa, French and English. And then when we went up to Europe, we intentionally moved to France so we could have a bridge language, so we could communicate with our neighbors, so we could talk, and so we'd be able to start off being able to share the gospel with our neighbors while we were doing our regional work for all of Europe. But God had other plans and led us into Germany. <laughs> and we get there to Germany, and, and God and I had several discussions about this. I said, okay, listen, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older. My brain is calcifying. There, there's like, the capacity has been reached for language acquisition. If I were to be able to get to ministry level German, this would require at least two years of full-time intensive study. And then even then, um, the ability to communicate in German in a way that will not hurt my German neighbor's ear, <laughs> that would take several more years. And um, so, Knowing that, understanding that, and knowing I'm already stepping into this with a full-time role of, of regional leadership, I started. I took an introductory German course, but did not focus on that as, as trying to get ministry-level language. Really focused on, on the regional work at hand and, and jumping right into that. Well, as I'm doing that and, and seeing incredible things happen again regionally, really loving 
walking with our, our, our missionary staff and uh, walking through some tough seasons in their lives where they're really struggling to see how God was working in their areas and what he was doing, how he was moving. Uh, working with national leaders, they were just getting burnt out and tired, begging the Lord to do amazing things. Um, we started seeing things happen. It was really fun. It was really exciting to be a part of. But I still had this empty feeling of, okay, well, I'm doing all this regional work. I'm, as a missionary, also called to local. Um, Lord, how do you want to use me locally where I don't have a bridge language? What are you doing here? How are you working through this? And I was really struggling with that um, because while I absolutely love walking with these strong, incredible missionaries and national leaders, uh, these are all strong believers following Christ. And a lot of my missionary heart is I want to work with non-believers and walk with them and see them come to know Christ too. But how, how are you working this out, Lord? What's going on with that? And um, I remembered as I was walking with some of my good friends in Guinea, one thing I really challenged them with was, hey, we need to really commit to praying, asking the Lord to show us who he's already working with. How is he already preparing people to hear the good news, to hear the message of, of Jesus as the Christ, as the King, as, as the Messiah and Lord. Um, be praying that, and praying you'll be able to see that. How is he working? What is he doing? Who is he preparing for me to walk with? And so I started praying that prayer. And within two weeks of, of praying this prayer specifically every day, Lord, what are you, what are you preparing for me locally? Why, how are you going to even work this out when, when I don't even speak German? What's going on here? How, what, what do you have in store? Well, within two weeks, I received a phone call from another missionary friend. And he said, hey, Jerry, you speak French, right? Actually, I do. Yeah. And he said, okay, well, I'm here at this refugee camp. German has been in a, a situation of welcoming a lot of refugees in because of everything going on in the Middle East and, and, and different parts of, of Eastern Europe. And he said, I'm, I'm at this, this refugee camp, and I've got this man here who is from Afghanistan. And he, when he was in Afghanistan, we, well... Here's the thing. It seems like he, he is interested in Jesus, but we're not really sure because we can't communicate with him. You see, from being from Afghanistan, he speaks Farsi. But when things were happening in Afghanistan and he had to flee Afghanistan as a refugee, he ended up in Iran, spent some time in Iran for a while, and then from Iran, snuck over and somehow made it down into Switzerland and was able to receive refugee status. But he was living in the French sector of Switzerland. And he spent four years basically on the streets of French-speaking Switzerland and learned French. And now he somehow ended up here in this obscure, tiny little refugee camp in a town in Germany. And no one understands him. No one up here speaks Farsi or French. Um, but he, keep, he keeps on coming to us, and we think he wants to hear about Jesus. Can you come talk with him? Okay. That sounds quite interesting. Well, I go home and I, I, I meet him. This man, while he was in Afghanistan, he saw the atrocities there that were primarily spurred by radical Muslims, radical Islam. And from there, seeing that, seeing that again continue in Iran, to the point where he was getting really discouraged and then turned off by, by Islam. By the time he got into Switzerland, he started having dreams. And these dreams, he kept on seeing a cross. And as he was seeing the cross, these dreams would go on and on. And then he started seeing um, a man, a really bright, shining figure standing next to the cross. As he's trying to figure this out and feel this all out, um, somehow he gets his hands on the Jesus film translated into Farsi. And he watches this Jesus film and learns about Jesus. And it's at this point when I get called into the picture. And here's this man who God brought him from Afghanistan through Iran 
down to Switzerland, learns France, up to Germany. He brings me from Guinea, through Senegal, up to France, into Germany. Neither of us have bridge languages with other people, but somehow brings us together and we can communicate. And I can say to him, Mahmoud, this man that you are seeing next to that cross, that's Jesus. This person that you were watching in the Jesus film is teaching about Jesus and what he did for us. And he said, well, yeah, this is who I want to follow. This is like, I'm done with Islam. I know what you're saying about Jesus is real. I want to follow him. And so for the next year and a half, I was able to walk with him, go and visit this refugee camp, learn about Jesus with him, study the word together, which was a real trip because his Swiss French on the streets of Switzerland, um, it was kind of shaky. My French that I practiced in Africa, it was kind of shaky. So it, it was fun because I'd sit there with, with my, my English Bible and my French Bible. He'd sit there with his French Bible and his Farsi Bible that I had found him. And somehow we were able to study the word together, <laughs> really trudge through and dig through every verse and work on comprehension together. And I just had an incredible time. We get to this point where we're studying and, and reading about baptism in the word. And he says, this is, yeah, I'm following Jesus. I want to do this. Can you please baptize me? Okay. We go down to, we, we find a, a creek near the refugee camp. He invites some of his <clears throat> refugee camp friends, which are, are Muslims, down to watch him be baptized by me and, and another um, uh, Iranian man that I'd met in town who is a strong believer, um, had him come and help be a part of this, this, this discipleship process. We baptized him and we started praying, Lord, help this man Mahmoud. Um, if anyone's wondering, I've changed his name so that there's no issues with, with this being published. Help, help this man Mahmoud um, not be alone in this refugee camp. Help me equip him in a way that he can share Christ with, with others in this camp. Um, well, within a few weeks of him being baptized, he comes to me and says, Hey, my buddy that, that was there at the baptism, he's saying he's following Christ too. And, and he wants to be baptized also. Um, how do we do this? How do we get going with this? And the Lord started bringing fellowship to him, a body of, of other believers inside this, this refugee camp. Only God can pull all those details together. Isn't that, it blows my mind how in this tiny little town in Germany, there is this Afghani man who learned French. God was working in all those details. And he brought us together so that his work can continue in people's lives. And we praise God for that. And that, that I feel is, is really truly the testament and story of, of many of my lives going through this whole roller coaster process of wherever God is leading us, seeing how he's pulling pieces together, preparing us for these different times. And we see that even too with, man, <laughs> I mean, really truly, it's not, it's not really the, the habit of world partners to see missionaries move around so much. Normally you go and you stay in one place for a really long-term investment, which is what we tried to do in each location, but somehow God kept moving pieces. We know the world. We've got experience in so many different areas now being placed at Bethel University where we're being tasked with equipping and empowering students with feeling out this possible call to overseas service. We can sit with them and say, here's the world. We know it. We know what it's like in this area. We know what it's like in this area. We know how to equip and empower you so that by the time you graduate, you can be feel ready. You can go. You can be sent. And um, we're really excited to be a part of that. We're, we're thrilled to be in that situation. Um, if you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to read, I'm going to start reading in verse 22. But that's halfway through a story. So I'm going to give a little bit of a background to the story before I start reading. This this is a section where, where Jesus and his disciples are out walking, and um, Jesus poses this question to them. He says, hey, um, who do people say the Son of Man is? And, and they respond, well, some say 
John the Baptist, some say Elijah or, or Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. And then Jesus looks at them and he says, okay, who do you say I am? And Peter responds, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And imagine this moment of Holy Spirit realization in the lives of these disciples being face to face with this man that they're following and walking with and saying plainly out loud this thing that they've been looking forward to their whole lives. The thing that they've been trained as, as good Hebrew boys to, to talk about and look forward to and think of. They're now saying, hey, Jesus, you're the Christ. You're the one that the Lord has sent. You are the one that's to redeem us. And just the thrill and the adrenaline rush that they're coming to with this amazing truth, this amazing realization, this gospel proclamation, Jesus, you are the Christ. And that's where we're going to step into the story, starting in verse 22. It says, but Peter took him aside. Well, the, uh, along with this, they had this declaration, so I'm not reading it. They had this declaration, and um, Peter needs to learn a lesson through this declaration, actually, because Jesus takes the Jesus then says, OK, with with this truth, you need to understand that there's going to be some hardship. There's going to be some issues. There's going to be some pain, um, suffering, even to the point where I'm going to die. Peter had to learn pretty quickly that this beautiful declaration of Jesus as his Messiah also means that you need to hand over and forfeit your personal desires. That you need to hand over your, your, your intentions. Give up your flesh to the Lord and step into his desire and his intentions and his mission. So Jesus praised Jesus for declaring that truth. But then he revealed to the disciples that they, along with this authority and a power that they're going to have, Jesus is going to suffer. It's going to lead to his death. So that's where we're going to step into the story now. Verse 22. It says, But Peter took Jesus aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before you see before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There is a hard realization that Peter and the disciples had to realize. Declaring Jesus as Lord, that's not that's not the finality of this walk with Christ. That's not the end of what it means to be a Christian. That verbal statement of declaring Jesus as Lord is actually backed up by that physical and metaphorical act of sacrificing all that you are. All of your past, your present, your future, your baggage, your wounds, the lies that you've believed, loading your whole self up onto that cross, giving it up to Jesus so you can fully follow him on his agenda and on his mission. So for the Tysons, that's been that's been our heartbeat. That's been our journey. That's been our walk is to be crucified with Christ and to be alive with Christ. To follow our saving reign and king however and wherever he leads us and to help others to do the same. That I think is why we're now placed at Bethel University. That's our baseline for serving world partners at Bethel University as to help students fully embrace taking up their crosses and, and following them wherever he's taking them whether it means 
running a, a business in South Bend, Indiana, or being a nurse in the, the, the cardiology floor at South Bend, how do you carry your cross in those settings? How do you live out your life as a fully devoted follower of Christ? And we hope and pray that for some, when they come to this realization of who Jesus is, when they're able to look at Jesus, know him, be known by him, see him as Lord, we pray that that will bring some to a point of realizing Jesus is actually carrying them, asking them to carry the crosses a little further geographically. And um, for those, those are ones that we, of course, get really excited about and who we're called to walk with at Bethlehem University to help them, prepare them for serving overseas. And for some, what Paul writes to Romans really tugs at them. Romans 10, 13 through 17, it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. So it's this good news that Jesus is our saving reigning king, which moves some students to the point of needing to carry their message to the ends of the earth. And we pray that as students grasp that good news and respond to it by taking up their crosses to follow Jesus, some will follow Jesus where no one has heard. We've been placed at Bethel to help those students. I want to do a little side note here. We just went through Easter season. And Easter is a wonderful, beautiful time to really intentionally have us sit and reflect on what Jesus did for us, right? We go through that whole season of Passion Week, knowing Jesus is walking towards that cross, knowing that he was put up on that cross, he was crucified, he was buried for our sins, he rose again, showing um, that he's defeated death, and we are able to walk in this forgiveness that he provides because of everything he's done for us. What I want to encourage us in is remembering that that's not the end of the story. We need to, as believers and followers of Christ, to not only remember what Jesus did for us, but know who Jesus is now for us. That means remembering that not only was he resurrected, but he ascended to heaven. And what happened? God put him at the right hand, put on the throne, and throned as king of the kingdom. And we know when Jesus came to his disciples um, before his ascension, he, he, he came and approached them. And the first thing he said in the Great Commission that most of us omit when we talk about the Great, Great Commission is he said, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, and then he gives the commission. We need to understand this all authority. What is that talking about? This all-encompassing authority. If we truly, really believe Jesus has been placed on the throne as king, and if he says that all authority has been given to him, uh, the definition of, of kingdom means it's an area or a region where someone has rule or authority. And so when he says all authority, that means that right now, we here on earth are walking and living and breathing inside an established kingdom. That means that we need to look at ourselves and figure out, are we walking in allegiance to that king and that kingdom? Or are we walking, are we walking in rebellion to that king and that kingdom? Everyone's in this kingdom. Are we walking in rebellion to it? Or are we walking in allegiance to it? That is a big part of what the gospel is. Jesus is the Christ. He is a saving, reigning king right now. And we need to choose to follow him with our whole lives or walk in rebellion to him with our whole lives. And that's the message that we share. And so this is what we do with our students at Bethel. When we're walking with them, we talk about what it means to walk in the kingdom of God with Christ as the king. 
I want to share with you a battle that we're actually coming into as as we are um, moving into this ministry of equipping and empowering the the next generation of of, of missionaries. Um, and I'll be honest with you, as we were preparing to move back to Indiana, preparing for for ministry with university students at, at our denominational university, um, our expectation was. This is going to be a tough road. This is going to be hard because if you look at mission agencies basically across the board, the average age of the missionaries is getting older and older and older. Um, this month, April, is the 24-year anniversary of my wife and I coming on as missionaries with, with World Partners. 24 years, and we're still actually some of the youngest missionaries with World Partners. There's a whole generational gap happening where our young people, um, not just inside the missionary church, but in, in the Western church in general, have not been hearing, not been sensing, not been answering a call to go. And um, that's been very concerning. And that's been one of our tasks is to go and, and try and reverse that trend and see what's going on. And so we've come to the States really trying to ask the question, why? What is happening? What, what has created this gap? Well, something really exciting, I'll share a positive part with you first. Something that's really cool is um, right now, the age group that's in the university, that's called Generation Z. They're not the millennials anymore. They're not the Gen Xers, which is my generation. Uh, it's Generation Z. Well, the millennials and the Gen Generation X, they're the ones that really stopped hearing and answering a call to go and to serve. The millennial, the, the Gen Z generation is different. And this is totally catching us off guard and really exciting us. We're going and, and students are starting to get in, to know us on campus. We don't have enough hours in the day for the amount of students that are coming to us without us even saying much and saying, hey, we think we're possibly called into missions. Can you help us? Can we talk through this? Um, uh, uh, um, I'm going blank on my words, Barna, the research group Barna, just recently came out with a study saying the Generation Z generation, they're different. Generation Z is looking for a cause. They're looking for something to fight for. And for believers, the cause is the cause of Christ, the cross. And something to fight for is being able to carry this message overseas. And so they're saying there is a whole openness to Generation Z that we've not seen for multiple generations. And Min and I get to walk right into it. <laughs> and we get to have a blast with it. And we have these students just surrounding us now that we get to walk with and be super excited about. We called World Partners Leadership a few weeks ago and said, buckle up. World Partners is going to double in size in the next five years. Because this generation is different, and we're pumped and so happy that God arranged those puzzle pieces to bring us there to Bethel at this moment to jump into this awesome wave that is happening of, of this new generation. So pray for us as, as this is happening. But and I'm going to share the hard part with you. Um, with us going and asking questions, why have we not seen this yet? What's happening? What's preventing our, our missionary church youth? from hearing and sensing this call, uh, what's going on with the discipleship in, in our churches today, in the Western church and missionary church in general, that we're not seeing this great commission call spoken forth and, and, and seeing a response for, for our young people to go. Uh, an answer that we keep receiving over and over and over again, very consistently, which is driving me absolutely crazy. It's, it's really, it gets me fired up. It makes me not happy at all. Um, it's, it's scaring me, actually. Our youth today, in university and in high school, they're actually being discouraged to worldwide mission. They're being talked out of worldwide mission. And it's actually not necessarily because of the church. It's not necessarily because of their youth groups, but they're being discouraged to worldwide mission because of their parents. 
parents are telling their children, mm, missions probably isn't for you. Mm, missions is really dangerous. I, I, I don't want to see you getting malaria or typhoid or dengue fever and, and, and being really sick, possibly dying on the field. Missions is really dangerous. The areas of the world right now where, where we're sending missionaries into the 1040 window and, and to work among Muslims, the persecution that's happening there, the kidnappings that are happening in, in Nigeria and other places, we can't send you into that. Mm, missions probably isn't for you. You know what? I, I love you too much to see you go. The, the, the time period of how long you'd be overseas before coming back for a visit, that's too long to be away from me. I can't see you. I, I can't let you go and do that. You're probably not called into missions. Can you imagine sitting before Jesus and trying to rationalize that out with him? Can you imagine that? I don't even want to put words into Jesus' mouth for what he might say, but... <laughs> To try and convince Jesus that, that you love your child more than Jesus loves your child. Mm -mm. It's not possible. Even deeper than that, I mean, I'm speaking to my generation right now. And it's my age group that has these high schoolers and, and college students. We are absolutely failing in the discipleship of our children if we cannot example what it means to pick, our, pick up our crosses and follow Christ. We are failing the next generation if we cannot example that, if we cannot encourage that. So if any of you are sitting in those shoes, ask yourself today what needs to change for you to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. To know what it truly means to Actually, put yourself up on that cross to lay down your life for Christ so that you can live for Christ. Because if you can't example that to your children, I really worry for the future of our church in the United States today. What's cool, though, is I think Generation Z might work in spite of Generation X or the Millennials. But I hope they don't have to do it in spite of. I hope they do it with the blessing of, with the sending from our generations. That's how the body needs to work. I've, I've counseled several youth and several young people who have had parents discourage them from mission and I always send them back with this, going back to your parents, please ask your mom and dad, show me how to live my life fully for Christ. What does it mean to be a fully devoted follower of Christ? Show that to me. Show me how to do it. And I honestly think it will be impossible for mom and dad to talk out of that lifestyle, of that life. And I pray for this generation that, I pray for my generation that we will truly know and see and understand what it means to follow Christ like that. And I pray that we can equip and empower our young people to do that. I pray that we can bring back on Sunday mornings. I think Crossroads is an exception to this. I think Crossroads is doing this. But we're not hearing the message on Sunday mornings anymore of, of we need to go, we need to be sent. And it probably comes back to that line that Jesus said to Peter, you're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Sure, we proclaim you as the Christ, we proclaim you as Lord, but are we actually living that? Are we willing to take that full load and, and, and knowledge that that means if we're to follow Christ, we example what Christ did for us by putting ourselves up on those crosses and following him. So, Along with, I'll share an example of that actually, of, of our generation. Uh, some of you may know the name Dennis M. Brecht. He uh, has been an important figure in, inside the missionary church denomination for multiple years. He was the senior vice president at Bethel University for a while. 
he, not even five years ago, was speaking up at a, a missionary church camp. <clears throat> he was speaking to um, older generations, um, and he had this whole hour-long message that was focused on just encouraging parents and grandparents. We need to be willing to pray that our children, that our grandchildren, would be willing to at least consider a call. Maybe some of them might actually be called into ministry. He wasn't even focusing on missions in general. He just said ministry. We need more pastors to be raised up. We need more leaders to be raised up inside our church. So would you be willing to pray that your children or grandchildren would be willing to consider a call, that some might be called into ministry? A whole hour-long message on this. And at the end of this time, up at Prairie Camp in, in northern Indiana, Goshen, Indiana, at the end of that time, he didn't even do an altar call thing. He just said, anyone willing to pray that prayer that at least some of our children might be called into ministry, stand up and pray with me about that. He stood and he waited. Packed auditorium. Only one couple stood up. 85-year-old <coughs> grandparents, former missionaries to Ecuador, lifelong missionaries to Ecuador and Russia. No one else stood up to even pray that their children, some of them, may consider a call into ministry. That's the state of our church. That's something we need to pray against. That's something we need to look introspectively in our own lives and ask, why is this happening? How do we stand against it? So, along with our work on Bethlehem University campus, walking with students that sense a call to serve overseas, we're also putting a call out to our denomination. Do we have youth that can be called to the ends of the earth? How can we walk with parents, with youth pastors, with churches, with our youth to help them hear this call, help them to go? We want, those, we want to start those conversations, and we want to feed those students to Bethel University or other places so we can walk with them. And from Bethel, more Partners is ready to send them to the ends of the earth. We're saying the Great Commission call is not dead on the missionary church today. Because how beautiful are the feet of the messengers that bring good news. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? Again, we look back and we praise God for how the Spirit has taken us all over the world now to this point where we get to be here in the United States and, and continue sharing this message and reviving this call to go. And we're so thankful for Crossroads and how you are a beautiful sending church. We've been able to partner with you for at least 23 years now doing this. And so we're blessed by Crossroads. And we invite you to pray with us as we do that call out to the missionary church, as we do that call out at Bethlehem University, that men and women will see Jesus face to face, know him as their saving reigning king seated on the throne. And they will do whatever they can to follow him, no matter what, no matter how he asks. And we accept that several, when they see Jesus under that light, they can't help but go to the ends of the earth. I'd love to talk with you more about this. If you'd like to come and ask me questions afterwards, if you are sensing a call to serve in missions, come talk to me. Come talk to Pastor April Hirschberg is back there. She's an expert also. Go talk to someone about it. We'll be happy to pray with you, continue this conversation. And, and Crossroads is a sending church. They will help make sure you get there. If you are struggling and wrestling, if you've had an experience where you may have possibly discouraged your son or daughter or grandchild into considering missions, I'd love to talk with you about that too. Talk with you about how to go in and open that conversation back up. Talk with you about how to example in your own life as you go. But we thank you for walking with us. We thank you for praying with us and for partnering with us in all this. Thanks. Um, don't leave. <laughs> I'll pray for you. A couple things. Thank you for your word. And 
I love it when people speak prophetically. We need prophetic voices. And thanks for being sensitive to the spirit to speak prophetically, because I agree with you. Um, if you are a part of Crossroads, you are a prayer for missions. That's a non-negotiable, all right? You need to know who the people are in the back wall. One of the great things about having some of our partners coming to visit is you need to know who these people are and you need to be praying for them. So over the weeks and months to come, we're gonna have more, all right? And so we are prayers for the harvest field, Luke 10 to, that God will raise up more workers. Um, many of you are givers and financial givers. And so I just made reference a couple weeks ago that our Dominican Republic trip in astounding, miraculous ways had money raised quicker than we've ever raised money for a short-term trip before. And that's because of the generosity of Jesus overflowing from your lives. So keep giving. If you don't give to kingdom work, start. You'll be blessed. Um, God is honored and your life will be changed. Uh, it's a joy to give. And you don't understand that until you give. <laughs> and if you know a giver, you know they got joy because they're generous. Um, the other thing is, and I'm speaking this pastorally, um, but I think it's neat how God has provided us with solid, consistent people serving around the globe. It's not about smoke and lights. This church has never been about smoke and lights. And Lord willing, it never will be. It's about exalting Jesus. And it's about the kingdom of God. And it's about consistent, simple, humble faithfulness. Pure and simple. Because that's the way of Jesus. And so I can let this guy and April shared a while ago. I have no trepidation. Take the mic. Um, I don't. Jeremy could preach here every Sunday. I'd be fine with that. Because I know it's hard. And you don't serve for 24 years in different places around the globe being sent and do that willingly with a servant heart unless you have one. And so thanks for modeling that. I appreciate that. Um, and so we're blessed as a church family to have really good, solid, faithful, humble missionaries that are a part of our body and extension. Um, and we don't take that for granted. That's, that's a God thing. And so we're thankful for that. And for us to be partners with you for 20 plus years, I mean, in my limited realm of ministry, it's almost unheard of anymore, you know? Everything in ministry seems to be the quick, flashy thing, let's do it and get over with. No, <laughs> that's not how it works. It's small things, consistent things, faithful things over time. That's what it's about. And so I love hearing about your journey and where God has brought you and where you are now. I think it's just, it's amazing. And so thank you for being transparent with us this morning. And so as the pastor here, I'm blessed with um, your buy-in that the ministry, it's not about this church, right? Christ is building his church. One local expression is crossroads. But it's about the kingdom. It's about that man from Afghanistan who was connected with Jeremy. And because we support Jeremy, we're a part of that relationship even though we'll never know the guy from Afghanistan. That's what it's about. But we constantly have to be reminded of that because the world mentality can so easily seep into the church where we start to think it's about us. It's about Christ, his kingdom, and the Great Commission. And so thank you for being faithful to what he's called you to do. Would you stand and pray? No, no. Be the doxology. Actually, the church. I don't think you got. Father, I thank you for our brother and for bringing him here.
Thank you for his family. Thank you for his prophetic word spoken over us. And we need to be challenged in our walk with you. And I thank you for the challenge that he's laid out. That we all can live that pick up our cross life for others to see. Whether we're parents or grandparents, whether we're single, have no kids, not married yet, doesn't matter. We've got, all got the same call to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily and to follow you, Jesus, in your footsteps. So I pray for the Tice family. I pray a, a blessing and anointing over their uh, new ministry that you've called them to. Lord, I pray that you would give them the gifts, the wisdom, the discernment as they continue to pour into these university students, as they interact with these students' families. Uh, we thank you for the, the joy that you brought these students, the, the passion to pursue the call. And we pray, Lord, that the roadblocks that maybe some of them have experienced so far would be broken down in the name of Jesus, that they would be encouraged and energized along the way my family members, as well as the church, coming alongside of them and throwing gasoline on the fire of your spirit in their lives. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for this morning, the way that your Holy Spirit is working in each one of us. Continue that throughout this next week. May we be faithful in the ministry that you've called us to in our own realm of influence. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.